Ja, nu wel eigenlijk, ja. Thanks, veel plezier. Oh wow, <laughs> what a doodse stilte. What a, I, I didn't know we started already, but a warm welcome everyone. Good that you're here. Uh, thanks for technique being so on point because we needed to start actually, so that's a good thing. Um, welcome to the program Faking the Fake News. My name is Tim Wagemakers. Mm. I'm gonna take a sip of water because I wasn't expecting this. Um, uh, I'm program editor at the Bali and tonight I'll be your host uh, on this special program with our guest of honor, Craig Silverman. Happy to have you here, thank you. Um, and as the Bali, we initiated and made this program together with Floor, uh, the debate platform of the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, or as Dutchies call it, the HVA. Um, and actually, they wanted to organize this, and we also wanted to do that because, well, the topic of fake news, of misinformation, is more urgent every day, maybe. Uh, the word fake news is used by many, from uh, world leaders to uh, anonymous commenters on the internet. And it sometimes feels like, or people describe it as we live in a sort of fake news times, or uh, bigger words even, post-truth society. Uh, and we have two hours to sort this all out and to understand everything and maybe also to solve it. So we have quite a challenge today, but let's see how far we can get. Um, we're going to talk with this, uh, about this with Craig Silverman and three distinguished guests from the Netherlands. And at the end of the night, there will be also room for your questions. So bear with me until then. Um, and first, I'd like to invite really short on stage Frank Kressin, uh, Dean of the Faculty of Digital Media and Creative Industries. Yeah, yeah. take the mic. Thank um, you. Because actually the, the request to organize this came from Floor, came from the HVA. Why did you want to discuss this topic now? Why do you think it's so pressing to discuss it right now? Yeah, I think we have about uh, 46,000 uh, students and for them it's ex extremely important to understand this phenomenon because it's really targeted at, at us, at all of, of us, and it's, it affects their agency as students, as future professionals and also as citizens. So we have to study it in detail. At the same time, in my faculty, digital media and creative industries, we are educating these media producers. So for them, it's even more important that they really know what this is about. So they will be able to combat it, uh, to understand it, and maybe also to smother it in some sense. Then we also have research. So one of our lecturers, Sabine Niederer, together with Richard Rogers from the University of Amsterdam, uh, continue, they do studies in this field. And while they say it's, it influence, its influence on political debate at this very moment is still small, it's increasing. So that also means that we have to do something about it. And finally, also myself as a person, I'm really bothered by this because I feel that fake news is deliberately trying to attack our institutions, our trust and our sense of community. Community. So we cannot let that succeed. So the more we know about yeah. this, the more you talk about this and enlighten us, the more we can actually do. So I hope you will, will do that uh, and we can use your knowledge collectively uh, in our education and help our students and therefore future citizens better. Well, I think that's quite a concise and precise story. So I think we're going to leave it with that. But give me a warm welcome and uh, thank you for that. Frank Gesin. Um, so I think right before we start the conversation and, and the keynote of Craig, maybe it's good to already have a bit of a glimpse of who we're talking with tonight, uh, because we have three people talking tonight with us, each from their own, I think, professional place in their field who offer different perspectives, but still are all involved well, with, with the word, the concept and the implications of it maybe. So maybe it's good to introduce you with a few short questions and short responses so that people understand who we're talking with <laughs> and then we can listen to Craig. So, uh, maybe Marcel Gelauf, if I start with you. You're now eight years, I think, editor-in-chief of N NOS News. Yeah, a bit more. A bit more, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm really hesitant with the introduction uh, <laughs> since we're talking fake news, so correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I would uh, say that you work... A, a mistake isn't fake news. A mistake is just a mistake. Yeah, yeah. but that's already something that maybe sometimes is, uh, how do you say it, confusing in these discussions. Uh, well, um, a mistake or something that you don't agree with is being uh, uh, summarized as fake news, is being framed as, mm. as fake news uh, since our, <laughs> our colleague Greg invented um, yeah. uh, the slogan Sorry. fake news, yes. <laughs> um, but uh, um, well, we, we can have a laugh about it, but I, uh, I do agree with, with what you were talking about yeah. um, with, with, with the Dean or what yeah, the, dean. Yeah, yeah. With the Dean. Frank. Um, I, do agree, uh, I do agree with him that 
the concept of fake news, the words, the, the way the words fake news are being used nowadays for anything you don't agree to or uh, to hurt someone or to hurt an organization or to denounce anything you yeah. don't like is really hurting journalism and by that is hurting democracy. Yeah. And can you make maybe a concrete example to start off? Because I know the stickers, you know, we had the NOS is fake news stickers yeah. uh, on the news. H how does it affect uh, the work of the NOS newsroom? Does it have an impact? Um, well, the, the, the stickers, there's not more than one guy who had some uh, printed some stickers mm -hmm. and he, he put them on, uh, on, on any place he liked. Um, and that feeds uh, the feeling of people that you can use the word fake news for what we were saying, anything you don't like, you want to renounce. Yep. Um, we, we see the, the, the use of the word fake news in, in a lot of reactions of the public to our, uh, our broadcasts, our, yep. uh, our news broadcasts. Um, uh, and they, they use it to, um, um, well, to say that they, they don't agree, mostly yep. that if they, don't, if they don't agree that we, that we air uh, something, we air facts, or we, what we yep. consider facts. Um, and and uh, by using the word fake news, they try to say that, that they think, um, or uh, maybe they want to put a frame on us, that we deliberately uh, try to air yeah. um, unreal things, or that yeah. we got a, a political purpose, or something like that. I think that's something we're going to discuss a lot further later. But maybe lastly, to top it off, how are you going to listen as the anchor of NOS News? What are you curious about when listening to Craig, who coined the term fake news, <laughs> or, or popularized it? Well, I do hope that if we leave all together uh, at the end of the evening, that we are more, a bit more optimistic about um, uh, the, the, the term fake news in the sense that we're more optimistic about the position of journalism in our democracy. Yeah. And that we can maybe somehow find a solution to, to, to counter yeah. the, the misuse of the word fake news. Optimism and solutions, maybe. Yeah. Yes. Shannon Bakker, you actually work as a fact checker for, uh, I think it's the most visited news website, Nu.nl. Yes. <laughs> um, and and, and Nu.nl is quite interesting in this debate because you've worked together with Facebook to actually serve as a sort of referee and to see on Facebook what is fake news and what is not and what should we allow on Facebook mm -hmm. and what should we, uh, uh, what content can be taken down? No, they don't take content down. That's a common misperception. It's a, well, it's how you look at it, but they place it lower in the timeline, but they don't remove mm -hmm. uh, fake content. So that's an yeah. important distinguishing yeah. to make. Uh, but actually, you're in the middle of the discussion, and recently yeah. Nupentanel stopped working with Facebook. Can you say something really short why at first you were collaborating with them, and then now it's over, and you thought, well, we shouldn't do this? Well, I was still studying when we started with Facebook, so I can't say mm -hmm. that much about it, but I know that we were just mostly curious about what was fake news uh, on Facebook, because we have seen the word with the Trump uh, election. Yep. Uh, and I think that was one of the motivations that we were just very curious to see what was out there. And that's been the mo motivation for me as well, that it's a new source mm -hmm. to see uh, what kind of rumors or yep. Disinformation is going on on Facebook, but um, coming to the uh, US elections next year, uh, Facebook has changed what you can and can't fact check um, within the program. And we felt they made some unfair distinguishments between politicians and yeah, yeah. Uh, other groups. So that was the main reason why we quit the program. Yeah. What are you going to listen to more attentively in Craig's talk? Um, I was really curious because I get that question quite often if the disinformation we're seeing now is fundamentally different from what we've seen throughout history. Hmm. Good question. I'll write it down. Um, Bette Dam, also a warm welcome to you. Uh, you're a journalist actually with your boots on the ground, I can say. Uh, you've been reporting in very difficult circumstances. You've been to Afghanistan, to many conflict areas. And, and you wrote several books also on the Afghan war. And I think you're the type of journalist that does try to gather facts in difficult areas. So, so does fake news enter your daily routine as a journalist? Is that a concept that you're <laughs> in your week pops up and you need to address? Um, I don't use that term. Um, but the reason that I continued working on one conflict, mainly Afghanistan, is because 
when I moved first to Iraq, but then longer in Afghanistan, I saw how uh, basically misinformed we are through mainstream, mainstream media about the war mm -hmm. on terror. So that's something fundamental. It's more like a phenomenon and how, what sources do we use? Yeah. Uh, so is that also what you're listening to uh, in, in the sense when you listen to Craig, that what's the bigger picture with regard to how we deal with sources and our stream of information? Yeah, because I feel like I feel um, a little bit ambivalent towards that term. So I wonder if we have a common ground somewhere um, yeah. Where we can learn from, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. We already have optimism and solution. Uh, the, f the, the fundamental question is it different from earlier times, and also can we find common, common ground on what fake news is? I think you can already address free nights with that. Uh, so, Craig, uh, good luck with that. <laughs> but of course, Leslie, a warm welcome to you. Let me introduce you a bit further. You're a journalist for Canadian BuzzFeed. Uh, you started actually to blog about misinformation, I think in 2004 already. Um, you covered the beat of fake news, actually, in the last years. You wrote a book about it called Regret the Error, How Medi Media Mistakes Pollute the Press and Imperil Free Speech. And you coined the term, but then I quote you, you say now I helped popularize the term fake news and now I cringe every time I hear it. Um, so maybe just before you uh, start your talk, I was wondering, because, well, the US elections are coming up again, you're mm -hmm. covering the beat of fake news, you have a president using it, you're tied to this subject now for over 15 years. Um, is that something to look forward to, to getting in that debate again? As a I don't look forward to it at all, no. <laughs> no? <laughs> I mean, as a Canadian, the idea that I have to deal with yet another American election is uh, completely deflating to me. <laughs> we just had our own election mm -hmm. uh, in the fall of 2019, um, and I'm, I'm very much trying to not just think about the United States and the work that I do. It's very easy when you work for you know, an American company, when you're yeah. for English language media, even though we have people around the world, I mean, you end up getting kind of sucked into the US perspective of the world. And so, I mean, uh, I hope that we do good journalism about the US election. I hope that we can do good accountability work. Uh, is it the thing I'm most looking forward to this year? No, no, no. <laughs> not really. So maybe it's good we set the stage to just learn a bit more about what fake news is, where mm -hmm. it comes from and where we see it nowadays. So the, the floor is yours, actually. Give him a warm welcome. Thank Craig you. Silverman. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, this is a really unique event. Uh, I'm thrilled to share the stage with some other people. And yeah, I mean, hopefully uh, I'm able to kind of give a little bit of background on, on my personal experience with this term, which I am, I'm not just ambivalent about at this point, I'm actively, you know, really hate it. <laughs> I think it's come to actually be used in a way to tar journalists and journalism that, uh, that is very conflicting for me. Um, well, I'm not conflicted about that, but the fact that I had a role in the term is, um, is a difficult thing for me. And so what I want to talk about a little bit is, is sort of that path of how I ended up starting to use it, how it became this very problematic term uh, that we're dealing with today, uh, and then also uh, hopefully give a bit of a larger context of you know, the story of the term fake news and what that actually represents about this very complicated media environment that we have today. Uh, and so, so that's sort of the idea, and I wanted to start with, uh, with a, a little story here that begins with um, this town in Macedonia. So uh, this is a town of about 50,000 people. It's called Velez. And uh, I got to visit it in the summer of 2017. I was there with two really good local journalists and they took me to this spot, you know, high up where you can sort of get the best view of the city. And so the journalists took me up there and they pointed out this factory that you can kind of see in the background there where we, you know, I've circled it a little bit. Um, and they said, you know, this, this was the main employer in the town. It was, you know, the place that everybody worked. And one of the journalists told me, you know, I did a series of investigative articles that showed that it was, you know, basically poisoning the town. Um, it was poisoning the water supply. Uh, the, you know, the smoke and the toxic waste and the things coming from the plant were also, you know, in the direct sort of air paths of the community. And that was helping poison people as well. And so over the few years, it didn't happen right away, but the factory eventually shut down and that rendered the town, you know, the unemployment rate went through the roof. Um, and, and so people needed to find new ways to make money. And one of the things that the young people did in Macedonia, in this particular town in Velez, um, was they started to learn what was called at the time digital marketing. 
Uh, and so they would learn how you can set up a website really quickly. They would learn how to get ads on it. And they would learn how to find content and put it on your website that would work really well on Facebook, would, would get you lots of traffic and earn money from those ads on your website. Uh, and so that became kind of uh, a booming industry in this town. And it started to replace what was kind of a factory manufacturing-based economy. It became um, more of this kind of information-based economy. And uh, in the summer of 2016, with a researcher named Lawrence Alexander, I was looking for kind of pro-Trump media around the world. And we found this cluster of sites in Vela's. And we started looking at the content. Um, and what we realized was that you know, most of the best performing content on Facebook was actually completely false. So this is a sample of you know, the kind of stories that they were putting out there. And they were getting insane engagement. They were, in some cases, they were copying stories from like American websites, and they were getting better engagement on Facebook because they were actually really savvy about how to promote their stuff, which included you know, using fake accounts to put it in groups and this kind of thing. And so we started interviewing people, and we said, you know, uh, I was like, don't you realize like a lot of these stories are false? Like, are you trying to get Trump elected? Like, what's the plan here? And one of the people I talked to, he said, yes, look, we know that it's misleading or we know that it's false, but if it gets people to click on it and engage, then use it. And so for me, it was this perfect expression of what the economics of media and Facebook in particular were rewarding at that moment in time. Uh, and so I ended up writing this article uh, that was published uh, one week before election day in 2016. Um, and there is that term, of course, in the headline, right? So how teens in the Balkans are duping Trump supporters with fake news. And this story got a lot of attention when it was published. Um, but it was after Trump won that all of a sudden, there was a huge amount of interest in it. And all of a sudden, the narrative changed from, here's an example of the kind of stuff that is being rewarded on Facebook. Here's the ways that people are making money online today to, oh, Trump got elected because a bunch of teens in Macedonia were spreading fake news. Um, and, and from there, that's when it sort of entered the bloodstream of the United States and from around the world. And this is why I, you know, I, I'm given sometimes ownership for this term. It's stories like this and other ones that I'll show you in a moment. Um, and that's sort of how I came to that point. But it starts, it starts a lot earlier than that. And it starts with nothing to do with misinformation or disinformation or whatever your preferred um, terms are. It has to do with corrections. Uh, and you know, this is something that's existed in journalism for hundreds of years. When I did research, I found that in the 1600s, the very first newspaper published in what later became the United States actually had a corrections policy. The guy who put the newspaper together said, if we get anything wrong in the first edition, we will correct it in the next edition. And that's been one of the tenets of journalism for hundreds of years that, listen, we know we're not perfect, but we will admit our errors publicly and we will be accountable for them. And so that's a really important ethic, and it's kind of this paradox that the more we're willing to admit our state mistakes, the more we are willing and deserving of trust, because humans make mistakes, right? And so this sort of embraces a, a human face of journalism. And I ran that blog um, for about 10 years, and I was a freelance journalist when I started it. Um, you could argue I maybe put my career at risk by you know, highlighting the mistakes that other journalists were making while trying to also pitch and get articles landed uh, in publications. But uh, you know, for me, it was about transparency and accuracy and actually us being accountable for the thing that we say really matters. Because journalists talk about truth and accuracy, but was there anyone actually writing about it or reporting on it on a daily basis? And the answer at the time was no. Uh, so that's where I started, this, this in, inward focus of how journalists gather facts and verify them, how we are accountable for our mistakes. And that was a 10-year journey that really started to change when social media became such a powerful force. And this image from Hurricane Sandy in 2012 really stands out for me. Um, this was a, a bit of a big moment for me where uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook had become you know, very popular by that point in time. And I was you know, very obsessed with how we verify information that is already out in the public. Before, you might get a tip from a source, and you have to figure out how to run it down. But now, somebody has put something online, and it's already getting attention, and it already has an audience, and you have to figure out what to do with it. And that was a very different challenge for journalists and newsrooms uh, than before. And, and in this example, you know, this was an image that combined a real photo of the Statue of Liberty with an, a storm photo from another part of the United States, and someone just sort of stitched them together in Photoshop. Uh, but this, this post is from an average person 
just a regular guy, not a media outlet. And when I took this screenshot in 2012, it had 300,000 shares on Facebook. Which, if you get 300,000 shares on your article on Facebook, it's like that's a you know <laughs> that's an insane thing. Um, you know, there might be a pizza party at BuzzFeed if that happened for your article. You know. And so in this case, it's an average person. He gets an amazing amount of engagement for it. It's the, art, the image is completely false, but if you look at his comment up there, it's a really identifiable comment. He says, nature is so powerful, yet so beautiful. Um, and so many people identified with that. It was a very relatable comment. And the place where I've put the arrow is the comment where he realizes that it's not a real photo. And he says, you know, I talked to the person who sent it to me, who talked to the person who sent it to them, and it turns out it's not real. I'm really sorry. I feel bad about this. When he posted the comment, it had 99,000 shares. And so 200,000 more shares happened after he had sort of said, I'm really sorry, I feel bad about it. And in this case, this is not somebody trying to spread falsehoods. This is not somebody trying to manipulate the media environment. This is a well-meaning person who saw a photo, was moved by it, wrote a quick little caption for it that other people totally identified with, and it went off like wildfire. And this is a very different scenario for all of us to be grappling with. You know, journalists for seeing images like this and figuring out what do we do about this? Do we, you know, we, do we debunk this and do we talk to him and how do, we, how do we engage with our audience? That was a really big moment of realizing that, you know, the, the game has changed a little bit. The second thing that, you know, was big for me was 2014. Uh, so this is a website I launched called Emergent.info. Yes, I like launching websites. I did regret the air, and then I launched this one. Uh, and this was part of a research project where we were looking at claims that were circulating online, in particular claims covered by news websites. So we were actually trying to do some accountability journalism about journalism and saying, all right, there's some claim that's circulating online. These five websites have written about it. As of now, this claim is you know, either true false or unverified. Let's track the social share patterns over time. Let's see if they ever update the article, if they ever correct the article, and what happens with that. And so all through the late summer and fall of 2014, I was gathering these rumors. We were tracking the data on them. And where possible, we were verifying whether they were true or false. And so I spent months just inundated with how news websites were oftentimes amplifying these claims without flagging them properly, sometimes doing the good work of debunking. And that's when I came upon um, certain types of websites that I had never seen before. And this is an example of one of them here. So this is a website called National Report. The domain was nationalreport.net. Um, Conservative-leaning website. You've got Sarah Palin and Ted Cruz in the header there. Everything on this website was 100% false. So if you came to this website, it looked like a normal news website. The articles were written with you know, headlines that seemed you know, like they were in the language of news. The, the text of the articles was reasonably professionally written, again, in the language that you might read in a news article. And everything was 100% false. And you know, these two articles in 2014, that was when the Ebola scare happened, and people were really worried about it coming to the United States. And these are two completely false articles. You know, one about uh, uh, an Ebola-stricken passenger exploding on a plane, uh, which you, know, you might read and be like, that doesn't sound real. But you know, it got hundreds of thousands of, of shares on Facebook. Another story about a family being quarantined in a town in Texas. That spread so much that local media in Texas had to actually engage with it and debunk it because people were panicking. Uh, and this wasn't the only site like this I came across. There were, you know, I, I, at that point I had about a list of about 14, and I started calling these fake news websites because they looked like real news websites and they sort of read like them, but they were completely fake. Um, and that uh, article about a passenger exploding on an airplane from Ebola, not only did they write completely false articles and make a website that looked like a real news website, but they had fake journalists. Uh, and those fake journalists had Facebook pages and Twitter accounts, and they had bios that made them sound realistic. And not only would they write an article like the Ebola plane one um, and have the real journalists there, and the real journalists would like, be on Twitter promoting it and talking about it, they would have comments like this one where they pretended to be the pilot of the plane. And they said, listen, I just want to correct a couple details in this story. She didn't actually explode. Her guts spilled out onto the floor, okay? It's not the same thing. And so what they're doing is, one, they're adding more social proof to this completely false story. The pilot is weighing in. And they're actually, again, using, using the sort of paradox of trust of having this fake pilot 
say, you know, the story is all overall correct, but I want to correct a couple details. So by correcting a couple details, the whole thing seems that more digestible. And this is what they were doing. And these sites for their stories were getting hundreds of thousands of engagements on Facebook. And what we were tracking on Emergent was that when Snopes or local news or even big news organizations would debunk them, they would get, you know, maybe a few thousand engagements, maybe a, a tens of thousands of engagements. It would be a tiny fraction of what the fake news site was getting. And so the, complete, the environment was completely tilted in favor of extreme, of false. And so I started you know, talking about these fake news websites publicly. When I released my research paper uh, in 2015, I had an entire section that was dedicated to talking about this and talking about the dynamics. Um, and this is when, you know, 2014, 2015, this is when fake news enters my lexicon and I start talking about it. You know, very different from the environment you sort of hear it in today. Uh, and it, and it kind of continued for me. When I was at BuzzFeed, I did a story about these two teens in Canada who were making um, their best month. They made about 14 grand Canadian uh, doing 100% false stories about Justin Trudeau. The whole site, it was called Hot Global News, and all it had was fake stories about Justin Trudeau. Uh, and that, so that was in 2016 when Trudeau was a, a global figure and very popular, uh, and they were making money, and they didn't see anything wrong with it. They posed for that photo for me. They did a video interview with me. They were like, we're going to be in BuzzFeed. This is amazing. Our site's going to do really well. Didn't turn out so well for them in the end, um, you know. But, but just two guys running in their spare time this website on, on their best month, you know, earning more than $10,000 and consistently earning thousands of dollars every month just making up stories about Justin Trudeau. Uh, and, you know, of course, later in 2016, a week before Election Day, uh, you know, I do my first story about the Macedonian teens, fake news in the headline. And I did a second story that almost nobody read. Um, I'm OK with that. It happens. Uh, but that came out literally on election day. And it was about the, tech, the techniques, the approaches used by these guys in Macedonia to subvert the Facebook system and Facebook's controls to make sure that their stuff was going viral. You know, how do they defeat the original publisher of that article? Well, they had networks of fake accounts in some cases, and those accounts would go and find every pro-Trump group they could find on Facebook and drop the link in there. And they would do this day after day after day after day, seeding it in places where the fake content that promoted Trump would align with people's bias. Uh, and so, you know, those two stories happened. Uh, and as Trump won, people started to talk about, well, did he win because of fake news? Uh, and that's when I did uh, another story. So this is one which was a data-driven story where I looked at the top performing articles from a set of almost 20 of the top news websites in the US and looked at the top performing articles on Facebook from a set of, you know, that were 100% false stories. And what we saw was that there was a huge spike in engagement for the 100% false stories in the three months before the election. And at the same time, mainstream news top performing content was actually getting lower engagement than they had in the previous six month period before that. Uh, and so, you know, this story published, uh, it was about 10 days or so, I think, after Election Day. This one kind of exploded. And, and at that point, suddenly people are talking about fake news. And there's a weird thing that happens as a journalist when you've been working on something for years, and, and then you feel like you're off in this corner yelling and nobody really cares, and you're just this weird nerd looking at these things. And all of a sudden, it's actually a topic that is becoming mainstream. What happens is, is that there's a lot of well, at that point, fake news about fake news, right? And I do try to reduce my use of that term, but I'm going to have to use it a lot tonight. Uh, where suddenly my stories were looked at and saying, well, this is evidence that Trump was elected illegitimately because people were tricked by all these fake stories. And at a certain point, that message makes its way to the White House. At a certain point, Trump becomes aware that this is a narrative, mostly among anti-Trump people, that you know, his election is illegitimate, that it's all a result of people being tricked and fooled, it's all a result of people manipulating stuff on Facebook. And so in January, Trump comes out and he gives his first press conference, uh, you know, first big one in front of the media. And he gets a question from Jim Acosta at CNN and, uh, and he looks at Jim and he says, I'm not gonna answer your question because you are fake news. Uh, and this is, this is a moment that you know, becomes memorialized, right? This is the first time he uses it to directly attack the press. 
And I think we all know what kind of happens after that, right? Um, I, I don't know how much he was doing this by a plan that was calculated days or weeks in advance. I don't know if it was a spur of the moment thing, but I know that he saw the feedback that this made certain people outraged. It also resonated really well with his supporters, and he's leaned into it for the last three years, right? Uh, this has become a central mantra of Trump, of the Trump campaign, and it's now turned into kind of a global thing. And I, for me, that press conference, that moment is the exact time when whatever work I had done in trying to define fake news as stuff that is 100% false, created to deceive, and done with an economic motive, as opposed to propaganda or other things, at that point, all of that was irrelevant because Trump took ownership of the term. And that's why, as you heard at the start, asking you know, these other distinguished journalists how they feel about this, well, we all feel really conflicted and you know, very negative about this term at this point, because it's mostly used to attack journalists at this at this phase. And I think, you know, the progression of this is important to note. So when Trump says that, and when Trump puts out his messages, there is a massive universe of hyperpartisan sites that are ready to propagate his messaging. Um, this is a map that was generated by a researcher named Jonathan Albright, looking at the interlinking patterns of, uh, of news websites in the 2016 election. And you can see these tight clusters of red and those are the right-leaning websites. And there are a lot of those red clusters, more than the blue clusters you might see. And kind of in the middle, you have the platforms and the mainstream media. And you know, what this kind of shows is that there are these massive networks that are ready to push out whatever is going to align well with their audience. So if Trump is pushing fake news, and CNN is fake news, and journalists are fake news, and that story is fake news, they're going to pick that up and they're going to propagate it. And so he had a built-in network to start getting this message out far more effectively than one journalist publishing stories about supposed you know, real fake news. And on top of that, what has he been doing all through 2016? And since then, he has been spending huge amounts of money on Facebook ads. And a, The Guardian did a recent story where they looked at a year of his advertisements, all of 2019, and a good portion of those were dedicated to attacking the media. So he has found a message that works. He has found a message of branding, you know, news he doesn't like, news that is critical of him, and established media as fake news, and it's working for him, and he's doubled down on it at this point. So this is millions, tens of millions of dollars being invested in undermining any kind of sense of what the media is, and in large case, you know, more traditional media. So that's an effective way, combined with these sort of organic hyperpartisan networks, along with the paid media, you start to get a really powerful result where you can change, literally change the meaning of a term from what it might have been in, in the originally to what he wants it to be now. The other piece of, I think, what his strategy has been um, is at the same time you're trying to delegitimize you know, traditional media, any media that is doing critical reporting, you need to find other things to elevate in its place. And it's not necessarily about explicitly telling people, well, don't trust this, trust that. He definitely promotes Fox News. But it's also about sowing doubt, and it's also about you know, promoting different theories and different approaches, anything that helps undermine legitimate media. In this case, this is Trump's Twitter account retweeting what seems like a regular kind of pro-Trump message. Um, but there has been a pattern for a lot of what Trump is doing where he's elevating accounts that are often connected to specific ideologies. And in this case, he had promoted an account that has been promoting the QAnon conspiracy theory, um, which, let me try and summarize this uh, very briefly. So they believe that there is a global cabal of child pedophiles who are secretly exploiting children on a massive scale while controlling the world, and that there is a government official in the United States who is secretly delivering intelligence on an anonymous message board using, using very obtruse coded language in order to tell them that one day there will be a massive amount of indictments in the United States unsealed, and all of these horrible people, the deep state, will be taken to prison. That's what they believe. And the fact that this person, this secret uh, Q, as, as he's called, who, who sort of delivers these messages, the fact that um, a lot of his predictions about what's going to happen on a specific day have proven completely false is irrelevant at this point, because it's become almost a cultish devotion. And the idea that the President of the United States is elevating an account that is invested in this conspiracy theory, is, it's, I don't think it's an accident. I think it's about an overall campaign to try and undermine legitimate media, and elevate other things to sow doubt so that he can sort of replace and be the guide for people. 
Uh, I believe somebody was hoping for positivity and solutions. I'm really sorry, but we're definitely not doing that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, now, and, and I think, you know, this quote from him pretty much sums up what that is all about. If you can get people to kind of lose their trust and not know where to apply their trust, then you can fill that vacuum in. You know, what you're seeing and what you're reading is not what's happening. That was about a specific bit of reporting on him, but it kind of is an overarching theme for this. And, you know, the point of this isn't just about the term fake news and how it's been weaponized, but all of this, you know, is being taken up on a global scale. You have autocratic um, governments, authoritarian governments all around the world passing laws uh, that are fake news laws that can actually criminalize the opposition and criminalize media that are attacking you know, any reporting they don't like as fake news. So it has become this global phenomenon that makes so many people in journalism extremely uncomfortable with the term. And I personally do try to avoid it now as much as possible. But the example of, of what's happened to the term fake news is actually an example of these kind of larger afflictions we have in our media environment. Um, to me, it's an example of how you can manipulate the media environment that we have today and how this environment, while it's amazingly democratic, is also so easy to manipulate. And that leaves me, you know, here, I did write this story at the end of 2017 to kind of say, like, I'm really sorry, everyone. Like, I had good intentions when I used this term. I never imagined it getting to this point. Uh, but as a case study, it really speaks to me of what I see, which is this environment that is so easy to manipulate. Um, and if we set Trump aside and think about this, and we set politics aside, it's really incredible, you know, the kinds of things that people can do in this media environment. I, I do love the internet, and uh, I'm not trying to turn back the clock, but I think you have to think about all the different ways that you can fake the signals of trust and fake things in this environment. So, you know, here's, here's one of my favorite examples. Um, you know, this wonderful, thrilling Instagram post here, you can see it has, you know, more than a thousand likes. My favorite comment on it is the person who says, I like the colors used in this photo. Now, you might look at it and you think, oh, you know, something's wrong here. So, the comments and the engagement does not match what we're seeing, right? So, there's something wrong with this signal. So, how do these comments end up here? Why does it have so many likes? And the simple answer might be, oh, well, it's bots. See, these are automated comments, these are automated likes, and that's true. But there's also another level on it, which is that all of the comments and all of the likes came from absolutely real accounts run by real humans but none of them delivered the comments and none of them personally delivered the likes. Um, these people had signed up for a service where for a small amount of money, they would hand over the credentials of their account and their accounts could then be used to give engagement to people who paid for it. So you have real humans being turned into bots to trick other humans, right? And that's the scenario that we're in, uh, in this kind of environment. There is automation, there is manipulation, and there is a business model around it as well, which is a very you know, profound and important piece of this, that economic motive and that economic opportunity for people is, is really a big thing. Uh, another example here, I'm sure uh, Amazon is probably relatively popular here. Uh, I would encourage you not to, uh, to, one, to read reviews very closely, and two, not to put to, too much stock in them. And the reason for that is there is a global trade in four and five star Amazon reviews. Uh, there are lots of people who will ship you a product for free if you give them a four or five star review. And there are Facebook groups you can join. I'm not giving this as a how-to, okay? But there are Facebook groups you can join to be sent these free products. And so, you know, on one of these examples is, you know, someone offering a gift card and a free product to give positive reviews. The other example up here is someone who is soliciting people to give one-star reviews to a competing product so they can downrank them in the searches. So you run a raise, you want to go down, you know, there's a market for that. And this is, this is a huge problem on Amazon. Uh, a little bit bigger in markets like the US and UK and Canada, where a lot of these sellers seem to focus their attention. But if you simply look at the star rating and simply look at the cursory reviews that are there, you know, you're not getting a real rating of the actual product. You're probably seeing results that have been gamed to a certain extent. Um, you know, the other thing that people talk about a lot are deep fakes, right? So, uh, you know, this is an enjoyable one, right? We have Nicolas Cage. Uh, here is, he's Indiana Jones, right? Uh, this is him as James Bond. So when this face swapping technology came out, American Psycho, and this is one of the, the more recent Superman movies, uh, pretty gruesome, that one. Uh, and so, 
you know, it's kind of a funny application of new technology where you can take someone's face and swap it on someone else's, right? Uh, and this is, you know, the, the sort of the deep fake that people talk about a lot. But what was not necessarily seen right away was that in a lot of cases, this was being done to swap women's faces on into, you know, adult and porn content. And so you would have somebody with a grudge against an ex-partner who would suddenly face swap them into a porno and start s circulating that online. So it's been used for targeted harassment. And of course, there's concern that this could be used to kind of mislead people during an election. And so that's another type of manipulation. Technology is getting to the point where you will literally be able to put words in someone's mouth that they never said, um, and that creates huge problems for verification, obviously. Uh, and, you know, on top of that, uh, we talked about, you know, the, the rental of people's accounts on Instagram. Uh, this is another variation of that. So this is the social proof that was being provided uh, to prove that you could rent out your personal Facebook account and earn money. So you would get about $15 a month, you would hand over your Facebook credentials to someone and they would use it uh, to run ads. And so people were being sent these, these things to plug into their home router and sent laptops to enter their Facebook account on in order for them to be able to use your Facebook account to run ads. Um, and this is uh, a place where we see the intersection of the kind of financially driven stuff with the potential use for political disinformation. So you have that, and I wrote an article about this almost uh, exactly a year ago, of basically how people were being paid to rent out their Facebook accounts. And they were being told, listen, we're just a company, we need to create lots of ads, so we need lots of ads accounts. Just rent us your Facebook account, we promise everything will be fine. And people were doing it. Thousands and thousands of people were renting out their Facebook accounts, but what they didn't realize was what the ads were that it was being placed, that were being placed on Facebook. Now, does this look familiar to anyone here? Have you seen these ads? So these are, these are the pages you are, you are taken to if you click on a Facebook ad talking about one of these Dutch uh, celebrities here. Uh, and so this is, this is an example of the kind of thing that you'll see. They rent people's accounts to run misleading ads making fake claims about celebrities so they can lead you to a page like this and entrap you in a scam where you think you're buying something and it's not what you think it is or you get a small product, you pay three euro for it, and then you're charged 100 euro on your card a week later and every month after that because you've been enrolled in a subscription you didn't know about. Uh, I did a story about a, uh, this, a company in San Diego that was running ads exactly like that um, in countries all around the world. And they spent more than $50 million running ads on Facebook over a couple of years. So Facebook literally earned more than $50 million from ads that scammed Facebook's own users. Uh, and we found that they alone controlled thousands of rented accounts, and they had so many of them that they were actually renting them out. They were renting the rented accounts out to other shady marketers to use. Um, so there is an economy around this, and the people who were renting their accounts uh, didn't know what was being done, but when I told them, they actually didn't care because they wanted their $15 a month. Uh, and when, when I did my report and the company was shut down, they complained that they were no longer getting their $15 a month, even though people were being scammed around the world. Just to give you an idea, I mean, these are ads in some other countries that they were targeted. Um, they targeted this guy. He's a famous uh, news anchor in Canada. That's an example of like the kind of Facebook ad you would see. And so this is what was being done on a global scale. Uh, this particular scam is worth billions of dollars over the last decade or so. That's how much money they've taken from people. Uh, and, and I talked about how this sometimes is that mixture between the economic motive and disinformation. Well, so here's the example of my story about rented accounts from January. And then in March, the New York Times reported that Russia had rented people's Facebook accounts um, to spread disinformation during an election in Ukraine. And this is the kind of challenge and threat that we're up against, is that you can have economically motivated actors innovating new ways to get around the rules of these platforms, and then other people with different motivations can take on that same approach, that same technique, and use it for disinformation or other means. And so we have so many actors manipulating these platforms in different ways, it's actually sometimes difficult to keep track of it. Uh, and I, I wanted to end on a note uh, for your media environment, which I am by no means an expert on, um, but there has been some work to try and quantify the amount of, in this case, they called it junk news, 
Uh, and this was a study that was done by a couple of researchers here. And what they found was, you know, comparing with the same methodology that I had used to compare fake news and mainstream news in the US election in 2016, that, you know, the junk news, which was their term for not just stuff that was fake, but also hyperpartisan, um, conspiracy, uh, they found that it, it wasn't incredibly prevalent in the Dutch media environment. They did find that hyperpartisan news has really grown on Facebook, and, and from their characterization, partisan media has really grown a lot in the Dutch media environment. And that's why, you know, the thing that I would say for this discussion and overall is that we do a disservice to how complicated this challenge is when all we think about is stuff that is fake or false, right? It is much more intertwined, it is much more complicated than that. The stuff that is often most viral now is stuff that is right on the edge of misleading, but not completely over into false. Um, it is legitimate to have concerns about the quality of reporting, even from traditional uh, you know, organizations, and to be skeptical of that and to read it closely. And so we should absolutely, you know, push for the highest quality news and journalism we can have, but we also have to realize it's operating in this environment that is completely new and very easy to manipulate. So my final uh, three things, just to, as a takeaway before we dive into the discussion here, you know, the first again is, you know, we have an environment that is rewarding the people, whether it's teens in Macedonia, whether it's shady affiliate marketers in San Diego who understand how to manipulate this environment, who understand how to get attention, and they understand that the dynamics often reward the most extreme and sometimes false or at least misleading content. That is, I think, something that is an overarching challenge we have. We do have an environment um, with fakeness, not just in the content, but you know, in the likes and the shares and the engagement. Um, the trolling that is happening of going after journalists, going after people who others disagree with, harassing people off of platforms um, is a significant problem. And there is actually a huge amount of criminality that is happening in the digital environment as well. There will be somewhere between about 50, 15 and $30 billion stolen this year from the digital advertising ecosystem by straight up criminals, which is something that doesn't get enough attention. Um, and the last thing for me is, as we think about, okay, so what do we do? For every, all of us here, personally, we have to think about where we apply trust. We have to think about the signals that matter to us and think about our trust as a really important thing that we can choose to give or choose to take away. And that could be a situational decision, but we all have more responsibility in this media environment about the things we're seeing and what we're consuming. It's harder to be a passive consumer. And so thinking about how complicated and easy to manipulate this environment is, but also treating your attention like something that is important and where you apply trust is something that's important, is really important for you to find a way to navigate through what is a very confusing environment. And with that, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. You can sit there again. Um, maybe just, just to clarify it a little bit more, actually, what stuck with me were three terms that maybe can use to, in this broad faking fake news program, to help us talk a bit more fruitful about it, like can we focus a bit more, is you have, uh, you have the industry, the economic industry, pushing uh, for clickbait, pushing for rewards, uh, rewarding people with $15 or whatever, or free laptop to push this industry forward. Then you have the intentional undermining of media, for example, that was what you showed with Trump mm -hmm. or with other examples, and then Hanging over that is the sort of fruitful ground wherein this can work, and that is, do we still trust media, do we still trust institutions, and how do we consume our news? Is, this, is that a useful distinction to... Yeah, I mean, I think those are, are three of the Im important things. And, and the last one is, uh, the first two kind of caused the last one, uh, yeah. in, some, in some cases, a crisis of trust. And the worst outcome can be people sitting there saying, well, I just don't know what to trust anymore and I'm going to disengage because that, that is a scenario when you're kind of up for grabs and if you don't know the signals to look for, it's, you can start to feel really lost and that's frankly when things like the QAnon conspiracy theories yeah. start to pull people in because it actually offers an explanation for everything going on in the world around you and it rejects the complexity that we do have. Yeah, yeah. And how does that differ or is it only scope in what I think Shannon already said in the introduction, to what we're used to from earlier times, well, not me, but other people, right. uh, like propaganda, like, I mean, if you talked about Korean War or whatever, there was mm -hmm. propaganda, there were lies by politicians, and mm -hmm. there sometimes was an economic model behind it to sure. push this information. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things, so it's absolutely true, you know, we've had 
uh, propaganda and falsehoods forever. We've also had economically driven, like tabloids and other people who've made money from misleading and sensationalized and false information. And we've had governments who have, yeah. have lied to us. One of the things that's different is it's sort of an opportunity now for everyone to participate in that, right? We have a democratized media environment which has so many benefits and, so, and are so great, but of course that welcomes all different kinds yeah. of actors in. And so the ability for anyone to start to push into that and to participate in that is a big difference. The other one that I would note is we have a, a broad professionalized industry of deception now. So it's not just people who might be trying to make money from advertising. You have a rise of what people are starting to call black PR firms, where they literally sell packages of you know, media manipulation services. Oh, we have a network of 1,000 fake accounts, and we'll use them to promote yeah. your content. So you have that professionalized piece, and then you have this open market of people to be able to engage in it. And so that scale is, uh, is different. And, and on the scale of these platforms, Facebook has almost 3 billion users. Facebook doesn't know everything that's yeah, happening yeah, on it. Yeah. So that's an opportunity. Yeah. Maybe two more short questions. The first one is actually the examples you used. I saw Sarah Palin. I saw uh, Ted Cruz. I saw Trump. They're all um, rather right and conservative. Right. I, is, is that um, also the only way to look at it? Like, does it also coincide with political color? Or is that not something you can draw a conclusion from? So uh, the thing I would say overall is it's very much the context of the moment, mm -hmm. um, what you'll see. Uh, and so when you see Trump rising up, we've seen a huge uh, increase in liberal focus disinformation and misinformation in the United States. I mean, there's tons of stuff that misreport or deliberately yeah. um, you know, uh, falsify things that Trump is doing. And there's a huge market for that now. And so I think since Trump has been election, elected, the market for liberal disinformation has exploded. Yeah. Because there is, and people will believe he will say or do anything, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, where you often see a bit of asymmetry is, you know, speaking for the US model, a lot, for a long time, conservatives have felt not represented in traditional media in the United States. I know this is a concern you hear in other countries. And yep. there's some legitimate beefs there to be had. Um, but the response in the United States has been to, in some cases, build its own alternative media universe. And so that's why when you see that, that, that map of the networks, the conservative ones are bigger because they have been investing in this for you yep. know, 20 or 30 years. And so, you know, there are, there's a wide range of those publications, and some of them care a lot more about reporting than others. And so you do see, because it's a larger ideological universe, you might see more kind yeah. of misinformation there just because of its size. Yeah. Does this discussion sound familiar in the Dutch context, Marcel Gelaaf? <laughs> well, um, I refuse to, be, uh, to become pessimistic, yeah. though I must <laughs> say... Um, <laughs> But listening to to your um, to your your keynote and 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 and, and studying your examples, um, I'm not quite sure whether I will succeed. But uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I don't think the situation in the United States and the situation here in Holland, you can compare them one to one as the, uh, as the same. Um, uh, I think as a society we are learning to cope with the internet. We are learning to cope with Facebook. Um, so maybe that's the most important reason why I. Uh, why I try to, to remain optimistic as society, as, as we as a society recognize what Facebook is doing because of uh, uh, colleagues like you, uh, I think that will help us to understand what we can trust and what we what we can't yeah. trust. There are um, surveys, for instance, for instance, by the Reuters Institute of Journalism a couple of months ago, and it stated that the NOS is still the most trusted news brand within the Netherlands. Uh, our weekly reach is about 90%, so and every week about 90% of the population within the Netherlands somehow mm. uh, um, engages with, with our content. And sure, um, we are under pressure, the, the, the concept of fake news hurts us, hurts um, journalism, hurts the NOS, hurts society, but I think we are learning from that, we are learning to cope from it. Um, um, well. Slightly optimistic in that sense. Well, uh, let's be realistic. And when your story is realistic, but it's also another side. And that's, that's we are still a community that wants to, that wants to, um, wants to relate to, um, to yeah. informa information you can trust. Yeah. And, who, and who sees trust as a common 
common yeah. ground to live together. But I think that common ground is interesting because you also mentioned there are some things that we easily can sort of debunk or find common ground in. Uh, I did that picture of that hurricane, well, n nobody read it or decided not to share it. But still, I think if you put everyone in a room together and say, hey, this guy who posted it is saying it's fake, many people will believe him in his words, I guess. Mm -hmm. But it becomes a bit more fussy in the gray area. And that's also where you, I think, with Nupentanel have been sort of in the middle of, I mean, for example, if you say, um, um, well, uh, the sun um, doesn't exist, I think you would easily flag it as fake news. But mm -hmm. for example, when you have a media outlet on Facebook that says um, human influence on climate change doesn't exist, then you get into the ter territory where you as a fact checker of Nupentanel have to decide, do we think this is disinformation? Do we think this is fake news? Or do yeah. you recognize that situation? Yeah, well, I think the example you're giving is still quite clear cut because mm -hmm. that, that is fake. But what I've been trying to do is basically journalism, getting the best obtainable version of the truth. Yeah. So that is speaking to experts from universities. S quite often, uh, for me, the most useful tactic in discovering whether something is false or true is just looking for the original source. Sometimes that's even a satire mm. website, and you can see by the source that it's fake. Yes. So that that are two of the most important, and indeed sometimes it isn't clear cut. But I think one of the most important things that fact checkers need to do is be honest about that. Tell what your process has been, who you talk to and said that on the basis of the best information we have, we come to this conclusion, yeah. and that, that's how I deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Because actually, Craig Silverman, the, 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 the fact-check industry has also been growing. I think every newspaper has a fact-check department right mm -hmm. now. <laughs> uh, especially in America, you see that fact-checking mm -hmm. is yeah. so uh, integrated in the newsroom. But does it matter in that sense, debunking? Is that useful for the audience you want to reach? Is there investigations into that? Is, is so I think two, two things on that. One is, there is some data, again, mostly from the US, that suggests, you know, on, in some cases, fact checks can help people change their mind. Now, to your point, if it's about a deeply held belief, will a fact check do that? No, probably not. And so we have to recognize that, of, so what hasn't changed? Well, human behavior yeah. and, and human psychology. Uh, but what the interesting thing about the Facebook program, where they have like more than 50 countries with fa fact checkers, and I think a few hundred now, is in the end, they're actually, they're fact checking for the audience, yes, but they're also fact checking for the machines. Because when Facebook receives a fact check from one of its partners that has labeled something as false, the algorithms are told to suppress the engagement, yeah. the distribution of that. And so that is arguably one of the most important effective things that fact checkers can do, is they can help you know, prevent more people from seeing something. And over time, what Facebook is doing is it's trading machines on all of these fact checks so that Facebook's hope is, they w Facebook would love to have zero fact checkers working for it in five years because they've trained an algorithm yeah, yeah. to automatically spot false things. I don't think that's gonna happen, but that's, what, that's their thinking and how they go about it. So it's a weird, almost like a bit from the matrix of like you have all these humans toiling to feed these machines, you know? And that's a, a weird thing that has happened with fact checking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say that your observations, um, um, well, they lead to only one conclusion. They don't work together with Facebook, I would say, as a, journalist, as a journalistic organization. That we, we have to, or...? No, don't. Stop it. Oh. Don't do it. But I, I mean, the, the NOS yeah. is on Facebook, so you yeah, help no, their I mean, uh, yeah, but we're business not model. No, yeah, sort of, <laughs> because our audience is on Facebook, and we try to engage with the audience, mm -hmm. to discuss with the audience, but what we don't do with Facebook is fact-checking. Yeah. We're not part of that program. So what New Pantanel mm. did, you wouldn't do it as a, no, we, or you didn't do it. So. No, we've, we we refused uh, from the start. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because we uh, we thought we were helping them with their business model. Yeah, but in some sense, it's if if and then I want to go to better. If the entire Netherlands, I mean, the NOS has a great reach, but if you look at the entire population of the Netherlands, they are on Facebook. Many. I'm, I'm not so, so sure about that. So why would you I'm not want to check there uh, <laughs> as a news organization that has been organized, invented, to serve the entire Netherlands? Because we, 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 uh, if we would do that, we would, we would support their business model and our, um, um, and what, what, we are, what we are intending to do, what our yeah. obligation is as a society, to, to produce news as, uh, uh, as NOS yeah. for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. 
Better Dom, how do you listen to this? Because I think you're also here, and uh, we already before the keynote, it's, it's, you kind of want, also want to put the mirror on the journalists in the media, uh, if we talk about disinformation, if we talk about pushing narratives. Mm -hmm. um, how do you then listen to the story of crack? Yeah, so um, I came into the world of media, and now uh, also from the... Um, uh, academia perspective after living in Afghanistan and that is not so much a story of like people or um, weird organizations who try to come up with uh, strange articles on ISIS or anything like that but there is a different problem uh, and I and I don't know if we relate if we have something in common on right. that actually um, but this is about um, mainstream media, and then uh, in the Netherlands, but also in, definitely in the US, because the US is agenda setting. The New York Times in the morning is, is mm -hmm. very dominant for many other news organizations. And, and that has to do with the phenomenon of like, how do you cover, in my uh, world, the war? And uh, I noticed by living in the war, how we basically, produce fake news. <laughs> but as a, as a, the media. As media, because simply in, in the war on terror, we heavily rely on Western government sources. And I, that, that's, uh, to me, uh, a massive problem, because uh, one of my conclusions from the Afghan conflict mm -hmm is that because we have done that, we embedded mostly with troops, but not only that, even if we had our journalists in Kabul, we mostly called the American ambassador over the mayor of Kabul. Mm -hmm. The voice of the mayor of Kabul is not loud in the West, yeah. so to say. And that's a, that, that is the problem of a very big bias, which is related to a pro-war news industry. And how does that fit into the? <laughs> and how does yeah. that fit into the disinformation being pushed right now? Are you saying that that kind of gives the ground for distrust against media, for people, and that's why they get more receptive for that? Or well, I mean, I don't know. The 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 the, the distrust in media is a massive subject. I don't know if yeah. I am the one to talk uh, about that, <laughs> uh, but um, I do think that by believing that the American government is more or less the Mother Teresa of the world that will do better than the Kabul government mm -hmm. or the Baghdad government. Um, that sort of like loyalness to Western governments yeah. is less so maybe with our audience. And our audiences have been through the 2003 massive Iraq lies, uh, mm -hmm. for example. That's only a little example in the war on terror, actually. Uh, but we, we all remember that. Yeah. Uh, journalists don't. Yeah, but, but, but that's also maybe correct. It's and not, also not that journalists yeah. do not remember it, but journalists do not incorporate this in an ongoing narrative, yeah. if, if you know what I mean. In the ongoing narrative. Yeah. Mm. Oh. But does that also <laughs> maybe crack because, because now we're problematizing it a bit further, I would say, mm -hmm. that in, in some sense we're looking for also the ground in which the idea of misinformation, of people being receptive for fake news or for mm -hmm. uh, Trump saying uh, CNN is fake news. I mean, the Washington Post had a, a revelation that the American public has been lied to about the war in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I can imagine, and then I also want to go back to the Netherlands, that for someone who maybe sent their son or daughter to war, reading about all those articles, reading about um, then in the Washington Post that it was based on a lie, the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, that these sort of big events also create fruit or a, a fruitful ground for sure. people to say, why should I trust media? Because yeah. actually we're talking about trust. Yeah. I mean, look, the, there is, I think, an, you know, oftentimes with institutionalized media, like the big New York Times and Washington Post, there is a bias towards the other institutions like American government sources. And, there have been many examples through history, you cited a few, of them 100% just being completely co-opted and going along with the line. And, and that is one of the core difficulties and challenges with applying trust, is you know no one is going to be perfect, and you can know the New York Times completely fell in with weapons of mass destruction, and you can look at examples throughout history of those publications and many others, 
And, and then it's like, you can feel kind of, um, you know, well, what should I trust? And at the end of the day, you know, it's good to have skepticism across those things, but I, I think then it's a matter of the situation of, you know, what is the reporting from here? What is the reporting from there? How do these narratives conflict? And, and certainly are these sources on the record, are they named or are they, you know, anonymous government sources? And I, I think you can have a healthy relationship as a reader of hopefully keeping these things in mind. And, and I think journalists need to keep them in mind because that's where I started in 2004 was, yeah. listen, we, we screw stuff up, yeah. you know? But this is like the central challenge of humanity is how do you know that things can be extremely flawed but also still worth, you know, being friends with or still worth reading or what have you? Um, and so it's, I mean, I think it's, it's just a difficult, fraught thing, but I also think, to your point, it does get exploited by some people who simply want to pull people away from fact-based things and take them off into another zone. And so what does healthy skepticism look like? What does a healthy mm -hmm. level of mistrust in the media look like? Like, those are totally valid questions, you know, because as a human to operate in this world, you shouldn't have 100% trust in, in anything, but to also have so low a trust yeah. you don't know what to believe, that's a terrible place to be as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. But then, Marcel, I was struck by the um, comment of Craig saying that as journalist, in 2004 you thought journalists should admit mistakes because it generates trust. Well, at the same time, what you're saying is it's also used when you admit a mistake to exploit that you're pushing a fake news agenda. Yeah, but I do agree with Greg that you should go on and acknowledge the, the, the faults you're making, but also, um, um, uh, well, well, let, for instance, uh, Baudet. Let's na let's let's mm -hmm. <laughs> let's talk about him. He's framing you. He's framing journalism. He's framing the NOS as an unreliable, unreliable news organization, as an unreliable journalistic organization. Then you can do two things. You can say. Okay, let's shut up. Don't talk about it. Let's hope it goes over. And yeah. you can and you can try to oppose it. I think it's important to impose uh, to oppose your opponents and to oppose uh, politicians, uh, you, uh, anyone who criticises you on a false ground. I think you could. You, I think that that's what journalism needs nowadays but more but than we used to. But how do you oppose them in the sense that you, we're going into elections? Um, and you don't have to well, convince maybe, I don't know, you, you, you don't have to convince maybe a huge part of this audience or me, but you have to convince those people that say, Baudet is right, the NOS is fake news. And the moment you say that, um, everything yeah, well, afterwards you say is being the affirmation of, course, of what you're doing. Of course, you have to go on in reporting what you think are relevant stories to your audience. But just as we learned that, we, that not every tweet of, of Trump is, is, is breaking news, we mm -hmm. had to learn that as journalists. Um, uh, sure, we, we, we have to report about the campaign next year, obviously, but it doesn't mean that you have to accept everything that's being said about you as an organization or a journalistic organization. I think it's a wise, wise thing to, 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 to counter that, to discuss that, and to make visible what's, what's not true about it, what's fake about the accusation of fake news yeah. on yourself, yeah. Yeah. you might say. Yeah. Shannon? Um, yeah, well, I was just mostly curious how you go on about doing that. I've had so many accusations accusations that I'm working for the pharmaceutical industry and all kinds of stuff which are untrue. Why? Why did they say that? Uh, because I write articles on health-related uh, yep. misinformation. Uh, I say that in quite... Well, I've spoke to doctors and they say in quite some cases chemotherapy works and mm. stuff like that. And then people don't believe that they say, oh, you've been paid by pharmaceutical companies yeah. to tell this story. But I can't do more than just say, I'm a journalist, I'm working, I spoke to these people. I still find it quite hard to sometimes, like I can't convince these people. So I f I'm really interesting, uh, interested in how you go on and do that for the NOS as a whole. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's not an easy job. No. Huh? Um, <laughs> We tried to find a way into it. Um, the last couple of years, I think we remained silent when, when there were accusations about fake news in our direction, especially by politicians. And I more and more doubt it. I more and more think that uh, a, a discussion like this, a discussion about trust, uh, being open um, about what's coming in your way and a reaction to it and standing for what you are, what your what you, what you, mm -hmm. uh, assignment in society is, I think that 
that is what we need more than we than we thought that we that we mm -hmm. need. So you want to go out more in, in, in the next elections to no, not expose in, no, no, what no, you're... No, no, not in the elections. I'm not part of the No, election. no, no. But in the run-up too, you are part of the coverage of it. And you're going to expose more when you think no, that's a no, lie. Not, that's maybe not expose, but oppose. Um, um, just like I'm doing now, as I've been doing a, a few weeks ago in an article in, in NSC Handelsblad. Mm -hmm. just, just not accept anyth anything that's... That, not accept uh, every frame that's being, put, that's being put on you by, by anyone. Um, I think it's good to, to stand up against it and stand mm. for your values and, and um, yeah. um, well, and connect on that. Yeah. But that's what Shannon says. He said, I do that, I present my sources, I'm telling I'm a journalist, but then yeah. still I cannot convince people. Can the NOS yeah. convince people? Well, not maybe, maybe not. Um, <laughs> How do you feel about, do you feel like you make any progress on that? Um, well, if, if, if I look at the survey of Reuters Institute, I would say, well, maybe we're not do, doing that bad. Um, but um, I, I, I think about um, if you look at, let's say, the, the way Trump operates is coming over to Europe, uh, I would say that it raises a question for journalism, how are we going to cope with that? Yeah. Are we going to sit still and let it all happen? Or are, uh, are we going to, to take a position against it and stand for what we are and what our obligation yeah. to society yeah. is? Maybe correct, because everyone's looking for lessons. On we, There mm. are previous elections, there's been right. Brexit, there's been Ukraine referendum in the Netherlands, for example. It, and in America, I think especially, for example, there was the, the, the Daily, the podcast, who had a conversation with their managing editor, Dean Bekay, saying, what are the lessons you've learned from 2016 right. going into the next elections? Is there anything you can say what's like the pulse of where newsrooms are going right now to well, cover these elections or developments in a different way, maybe? I mean, one of the conversations that I think is happening a lot in newsrooms is the decision of when not to cover something, because that is, that's a very hard thing for journalists to really think about, is like, well, we think this might be newsworthy or this is being said by an admittedly newsworthy person, but because of dynamics X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. we're going to set this aside. And it also leaves you open to questions of, oh, they're censoring or you know, they're doing this. And so it's, it's a thing that makes journalists really uncomfortable. But there are absolutely cases where people are trying to get you to cover something. People are trying to get you to debunk something because that's just a stepping stone for them. You have given them oxygen and you have given them attention. And even in the act of trying to knock down an idea, even if you're doing it in a fact-based way, you're still in some sense at the risk of amplifying it. Yeah. And so that's a discussion I think that's happening a lot. And you, know, you talked about treating every tr Trump tweet as breaking news. I think that is a lesson newsrooms have learned is, is like he is gonna keep tweeting and he is gonna have stuff that is false. Yeah. And how are you gonna, when are you gonna engage with it and when are you not gonna engage? And so that's an overall discussion I think people are using a lot because I don't know the specifics of these accusations you're dealing with, but I would be willing to bet that this politician sees that as a very effective strategy, sure, and sure. that they're looking at how you're responding, is, and they're thinking about how do sure. I take advantage of how you're responding. I'm quite aware of that. Yeah, yeah. and so, so it's, a, it's a bit of a chess match, right? Yes, so is. how do you listen yeah. then to it's also more? also a catch-22. Yes. <laughs> um, because if you stay silent, yeah. what happens then? Um, well, that's, that's, really, that's really the discussion. Yeah, and the problem we're facing. Mm -hmm. Because I think, and that's, and there's no one answer, right? Like I can't say what the specific formula is, but I know for us specifically when we're thinking about things that you know we want to debunk, we think about the spread, like how many people have seen it. Is our audience likely to have seen it? Have influential people pushed it out there? Um, you know, we try to have a discussion about it, and just the fact that those discussions are now happening in newsrooms is probably a good and, and productive thing because. I think the lesson that a lot of politicians and other people have learned from Trump is, is that you can get a lot of free media by being very yeah. extreme. And by going yeah. after the media, you can get the media to cover you even more. And that's a dynamic that people are trying to take advantage of. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, yeah. and it's a dynamic, uh, I would say, that we as journalists have become more and more aware of and discuss how we're going to handle it. In, and, and I think that's a big difference compared to four years ago, six years ago. When and Trump that's came your out. optimism again. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Better we are talking about Facebook also in, in this sense, the industry which is also propagated by Facebook. And, but at the same time, I can imagine in your branch of work, Facebook was also a liberation for many people to give voice to people who are not heard, to maybe counter some narratives. Mm -hmm. And right now we're also, well, 
criticizing Facebook for pushing the fake news agenda. But that's a tension, right, between what do we want on our feeds, how do we uh, enhance the algorithm, how, how do you see that we should maybe deal with Facebook? Because what Craig said was we need to redefine our relationship actually with how we consume media on social platforms. I don't know, maybe I wouldn't go to Facebook, but I don't know what you think about Twitter. I have no idea, I'm not an expert on this, but there's of course a lot of fake news on Twitter as well, but if you want to have a nice line of like people to follow, you could basically copy paste yeah. my follow the, the ones I follow, for example. Not that um, it's perfect, but at least it's like I know s most of these people. I know who they are. I interact with them. You can see that's all transparent. I, I mean, that that is a bit more straightforward, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know what else to do. Um, besides that journalists uh, have to do proper journalism yeah. in war. And I think that's, that's my main issue, and that we need to go back to journalism uh, and rely on, on journalists who do a cross-check on narratives uh, on war. And, so and, and for that, uh, there's many sources on Twitter you can, you can yeah. connect to and get to know them and meet them and, and establish a network. Yeah. Yeah. But, but even you criticize sometimes mainstream media, you, you say the coverage of what has been done is not good, it's maybe mm -hmm. pushing also, for example, the messages from the Pentagon or, or other places. Um, how do you as a media consumer then distinguish between um, what is poor journalism and what is misinformation? Because that's then the difficulty, because I think you want to criticize the mainstream media, but you don't want to throw away the... How do you say it in Dutch? The baby with the mm -hmm. bath water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know the English phrase. Really. It's the same in English. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> then I should have said it with more confidence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, it's always a risk, of course, and um, I do think that maybe the short answer in journalism. Uh, not as a reader, but in journalism, as who has a public function, who needs to to try to be neutral at least um, mm -hmm. try, um, is to have an expertise. There's just too many journalists who fly in and out, write quickly on very very complex issues, where there's so many PR agents trying to use the theater where yeah. there's information streaming in and out, and especially in the war on terror, in terrorism, it's a very dangerous uh, subject to be quick. Yeah. You can't be. So the whole machinery of being the first, that should change tomorrow. Because it is dangerous. Yeah. It, is, it is fueled war. It is confirmed nar pro-war yeah, narratives, yeah, yeah. and so on. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a... Mm. The, 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 Basically, what is journalism? We need to have uh, that discussion yeah. if we talk about war. Yeah. 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 Shannon, what, what for you are the lessons from Nupentanel? Because you've been collaborating with Facebook. Yeah. Um, they had a different uh, approach or agenda to you couldn't fact check politicians, right? Because that mm -hmm. would interfere with free speech, I, w I would think, or with some. Yeah, but, that's what Facebook said, yeah. Yeah, and then you stopped. But would you in, 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 in the future consider, like, is there a role for mainstream media as Nupentanel to fact check, to do something about the stream of disinformation on social media? Well, what I liked uh, about the face, like, there were downsides definitely of the Facebook collaboration. What I liked about it is that we, uh, by fact-checking, we reached the audience that actually shared the fake news or the, the misinformation article, um, which was a huge proud to me. And I, like you were talking about, when are you going to write about something? I see that now we quit Facebook. I really use a higher boundary because now I want to make sure that a lot of my public has seen it before I write an article about it. Yeah. While we were fact-checking for Facebook, you knew that the people that shared it would ha have seen my article, cause yeah. or at least got a notification that it existed. So that is uh, what I liked about the program. So I do think there is a role, but we really need to think in the don't, that we don't get too dependent on these platforms. Uh, indeed, do we abide by their rules? And that kind of stuff is something we really yeah. need to think about. Yeah. Yeah. 
Craig, is there something we've been missing out on strategies we could discuss before we go to the audience questions on how to, well, actually get that healthy relationship between us and information better again? Yeah, let me, let me try to be positive for a moment, if I can. Um, I don't know if I can, so I'm going to try. Yeah, we're going to uh, see. <laughs> um, I mean, the first thing is, so a lot of good things have happened over the last four years or so, close to four years, which is that discussions like this weren't happening prior to the end of 2016. This wasn't a global concern. People weren't engaged about the information environment and media like they are now. Uh, you know, so the amount of researchers looking at these challenges, the amount of journalists and you know, governments and other people, you know, governments can go good or bad as they look at things, but uh, overall the engagement has increased, which means we are closer to improving things because of that. You can't fix anything if you don't start to interrogate what the problem is. Yeah. And we've had almost four years of a pretty good interrogation of what's going on in our media environment from a lot of different people, not just journalists. So that's a good thing. That's on our path to making it better. For, you know, for the, the average person, I, the first thing I would just say is awareness is really your best weapon. Um, awareness of this environment, awareness of how things are a little more complicated, of how you have to maybe spend a bit more time guarding your attention, thinking about what is in front of you and where it's come from, and awareness of your own emotions, because a lot of times content that is misleading or false is, is trying to get an emotional reaction out of you. And so if you create, cultivate a sense of emotional skepticism and wonder why you reacted so strongly to something positively or negatively, taking a pause before acting on it in any kind of way on social media, these are really good basic habits. And just cultivating that awareness, that emotional skepticism, and um, there's uh, one strategy called lateral thinking, which is simply you've read something somewhere, try to go somewhere else online and see if you find the same thing. Try to search for other articles and compare and contrast. Don't just take one point of view. See if that quote exists in other places. And try to, you know, try to practice that. And I think the awareness, the emotional skepticism, and a little bit of going outside that one website or that one article become really good tools for the average person. Is it also a generation thing? That maybe the issue is with people who didn't have devices all around them everywhere and that young people are maybe more media literate than older people. So in that sense, that gives some optimism that <laughs> in a few years it will go be better. Uh, so I don't, unfortunately, I don't think that's the case. I'm sorry, I tried to go positive and now yeah. here I am back. Uh, so, sorry, yeah, yeah. So here's the thing. So the, uh, the most programs that have been created around media news literacy have been targeted at students, at younger people. And I think that they absolutely need that. I think the truth is we all struggle to a certain extent. It's not about intelligence or things like that. Um, it's a very different media environment. So that's good that students are getting it, but a lot of the data in the US says it's people 65 and older who are struggling the most. Uh, and they are not getting the kind of support and they are not getting the programs targeted at them. And the idea that this is a temporary generational problem may be true, but here's the other scenario. Imagine, you know, I'm in my early 40s now. Imagine in 20, 25 years from now what our media environment and the devices and all those things are going to look like. And maybe I'm not as engaged in this as I am right now. It's possible for me or for anyone else to suddenly be disengaged to the point where things start to get really complicated mm -hmm. and confusing. And because you're not using them every day for work, you maybe don't you don't see it. And it's maybe possible that we all just sort of age out of the internet of whatever it is at a certain point in our lives. And it's not a one-time thing, but it's actually a natural part of aging. It's yeah, possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will keep on going being optimistic. I'm, I'm Thank sorry. You. I'm sorry. Um, the smartphone was introduced in 2007. That's only 12 sorry, years. Sorry, what was introduced? I didn't hear it. The smartphone. The smartphone, yes. Yeah. introduced in 2007. That's only 12 years ago. So we, we're still learning about uh, the internet, uh, how it works, what, it, what, it, um, what the dangers of it, how we can use it. I think the internet has helped journalism a lot. It, 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 gives, it gives us the opportunity to engage with our audience. It gives us dozens and, 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 and dozens and dozens more sources. Um, um, it, it, it helps us to, to reflect on what we do, on the mistakes that we are making, but we're only just starting. We're only just starting to getting, to getting used to it. And we have some catching up to do, maybe. Sure we do, sure yeah. we do. Yeah. 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 Are there any questions in the audience? People say this has been missing. Yeah, there was a hand going up there. Someone's coming with the mic. Yeah. Uh, my question would be to Craig. Uh, could you... Uh, explain a bit about the difference between misinformation and disinformation in the states and uh, also add the perspective of uh, foreign countries influence and what do you think uh, makes most damage 
Yeah, so um, the definitions that I tend to use, uh, I think there's a, there's a researcher named Claire Wardle who has talked about misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. And I think, uh, and overall, she puts it under an umbrella of information disorder. So it's not about true and false, it's about this really different information environment. And with her definitions, misinformation is the accidental spreading of false or misleading information. So the example of the Statue of Liberty guy, that was misinformation because he wasn't deliberately creating and spreading that. Um, disinformation is deliberate knowing creation and spread of false information. Um, she also talks about an intent to harm, which I don't know if is personally if that's necessary, but that's often put in there. And then malinformation is true information, but that is being weaponized for malicious purposes. So doxing someone, taking someone's real personal information and putting that online to create harassment or hurt them would fall under malinformation. Or hacking and stealing documents from a political campaign and dumping that online would be malinformation. And so those are, those are some of the definitions. And I think state-based actors can sort of play in any and all of those at any time, just as economic-driven actors and, you know, and average folks can play in any of those at any given time. Yeah. Yeah. In what sense uh, do you as the NOS or as Nupuntanel see foreign actors interfere in debates in the Netherlands with malinformation, disinformation? No, not really. No. no. I think one of the advantages, uh, advantages of, of, of living in the Netherlands is to be a small country with a language uh, <laughs> that's not being used a lot uh, outside of the Netherlands. I think that helps a lot compared to the United States and, and, um, yep. and, and the use of English. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? There's someone a bit further up. Yes, I have a question, and I, I am studying history, and it's uh, two things. First, uh, what do you think is a neutral perspective uh, reachable? I don't think it is reachable at all, because when I talk with our Iranian students, it's totally different from how I see it. And uh, secondly, uh, I think the NOS, for example, it is not possible to have huge conflicts within 10 years, very complicated, and explain that in one minute. For example, the mm. Ukrainian crisis is so extremely difficult. I uh, do my scripts, mm. my uh, research about it, and it's not even possible because you are missing a, uh, extremely important information. And I think that could be, uh, that could be, uh, getting more skeptical by people who are liking yeah. to getting fake news. Yeah. One question, one comment, the comment. Yeah, well, I do agree that uh, for 24 seven news organizations like we are, uh, complicated stories are complicated. Um, <laughs> and we, tr we, we, we try to, uh, to counter that, to, uh, to really go, to really make in-depth stories, especially on the internet or um, um, uh, air a program like NewsHour, which is a program that really has the space for, for backgrounds and things like that. But you, you, I do agree, for a 27 news circle, um, paying attention to all kinds of, of, of ways you can look at a conflict, um, yeah. uh, apart from, from the discussion of um, what, what um, yeah, uh, what, what, um, well, no, I do agree with you, yeah, yeah. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Better done, maybe the first question was about neutrality and, and perspectives, and then how you can, well, actually find out what, what is the neutral perspective, because the, the gentleman says, I, I don't believe there's such a thing as a neutral perspective. How do you, as a journalist in difficult areas, deal with that issue? Because you're all, always wondering, I guess, am I giving a version of the facts, or am I giving uh, a sort of neutral position, and who is influencing me? Yeah, I think uh, the, where we are now with the mainstream media, uh, like the NOS, we are far away from something that would come close to neutral. So uh, the gentleman is right. We have to we have to talk about this because it's uh, very problematic to to do these conflicts, and, and I am uh, talking about war. I mean, this is about people dying every day. Um, mm -hmm. And that has huge consequences for, for many countries. And so, is it possible to do neutral? I don't think we even try at the moment. 
so we, uh, yeah. we have a problem. Marcel Gelaar? Yeah, well, covering in war is, I do agree, is, is, is terrible, uh, is very, very, compli very complicated. Uh, it's a discussion about budgets. Uh, if we look at the colleagues from CNN, from BBC, they go over with, with a lot of colleagues, with armored cars, with, with armored personnel. We don't have resources to do that. Uh, Afghanistan, yeah. we, mm, well, yeah. <laughs> just an example, in Afghanistan we were embedded and we were not embedded. Uh, yeah. So we tried to cover the war from, from, from two parts, but I think, sure, um, our pers perspective on the world, our perspective on uh, the stories we're covering is, 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 an uh, is the perspective of where yeah. we're coming from, of the country we're living in. Shouldn't journalists maybe say more, I don't know yet? Yeah, sure. Uh, you, uh, if, uh, if you're not sure, express that you're not sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Maybe there's ah, there's one here in the front. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Yes. I'm working for a drug a Dutch uh, company working on disinformation, and I have a question A and B for Marcel and Craig together. So, Marcel, I'm very happy that trust is high when it comes to the NOS. That means that's an outcome of good good journalism. But I don't think it can be a strategy to fight disinformation, can it? Because trust will not attack a bot network or will not deal mm -hmm. with tactics of disinformation. So it's, a, it's an outcome, but not a strategy. So I was wondering, what is the responsibility of this trustworthy NOS to fight disinformation? And then to Craig, if I have the feeling that trust and good journalism are important tools, how can we go further to look into the actual techniques uh, if, if we know that amplification is easier with algorithms to spread fake news than to, yeah, to yeah. Uh, use for traditional media? Yeah. Part A. Um, well, <laughs> I th think the best thing to fight misinformation is, is broadcast good information and be a good journalist uh, and try the best as you can um, to, to cover a story from all kinds of, 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 of viewpoints. Um, and be aware of the environment you're operating in and be aware of what's happening on the internet and be aware of your sources that you have and of the sources you don't have and you need to, to, to look for and to, to so, roll them up. So are you actually saying that the world outside may change but as long as the NOS keeps doing what its core principle is it will well, in the end work out right? Well, that's, well, the, that's, the, well, that's like the thing... Well, not especially the NOS, I would say journalism. Yeah. Yeah. Part B? So one of the things that I've been trying to do and that there are other people trying to do in journalism is put the skills in newsrooms for journalists to understand how to do things like in investigate bot networks. But it's not about very technical things a lot of the time. It's about a mindset and an understanding mm -hmm. of the environment. And, uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of very basic techniques and tools that I find are um, shockingly not present in newsrooms. Uh, and so we have a huge skills and training gap. And this stuff isn't necessarily specific to disinformation. This is about any type of digital investigative work, which I think should be accompanied by traditional, you, talking to humans never goes out of style. Like, that's a big thing. And so <laughs> I think that's, how do, we, how do we do this better? We need to increase the skills and training in newsrooms around this. Um, you so know, in this building, Bell and Cat is based. Yeah. They do fantastic work. Can you name area. a concrete tool that we should learn more in newsrooms that, that, that should be added? Uh, I mean, uh, I'm still surprised by how many journalists don't know about reverse image search, which is like insane to me. Uh, mm. And that's, it's like embarrassing to have to say that out loud, that a lot of journalists yeah. don't know that. And so, uh, you know, trying to make these uh, tools and the t techniques and approaches really accessible to journalists is, is a big thing of what yeah. I'm doing. Like we're I'm a bit hesitant to explain and, it, but it's yeah. an image that you try to backtrack where it comes from so you can see Yeah, just like you would yeah, search yeah, yeah. text and find everywhere on, you know, on websites that that text exists, so you can take an image yeah. and search where else online that image is. And it's often helpful for finding mm -hmm. out where it originally came from. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, now, what I wanted to <laughs> add, uh, I've been, I've read an article about fake ads and I think there's a role for journalism also to indeed with the tools uh, that you're pointing out to find out like the mechanisms behind fake yeah. news. That, that is a part of what journalism is and what we should do as 
well, yeah. investigative, but also like at a website like Newpunt now, yeah. that's something we can do. Short edition? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to say that uh, I do agree. We have to invest in in all the things you're describing. For instance, we had a guy of Bellingcat uh, uh, in a newsroom for one week mm -hmm. just to, do, to, to yeah. learn from him about the way he looks at the world and to enlighten us about um, what we can learn from him. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. We have, to invest optimistic, we, have yeah. to, uh, uh, we have to really invest in technique, uh, techniques yeah. and knowledge like that. Um, but, but um, well, uh, and meanwhile, the 24-7 circle goes on, <laughs> and that's, mm -hmm. that's, that, that's a, that's a, a huge problem. Is there ever a moment in your news desk that you wonder, like, can we break this 24-7 news circle? Do you have that fundamental discussion? Um, uh, no, 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 not in the sense that we're discussing whether we should stop whether, that. Whether, 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 no, it's, uh, um, it, it, it's part of our assignment that we air news 24 7. Um, but and is I, and that I think even able to, to sort of think out of the box and like, is that actually good for us? This no, we, we try to do both. We try mm -hmm. to, to air some basic facts 24 7 and we try to, to, to put resources in, in, uh, in backgrounds, in explainers, in being uh, on the internet, on being connected mm -hmm. to society. We try to do both, but, um, well, for instance, something quite simple mm -hmm. as a storm mm -hmm. this, 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 um, this weekend. Online, we had 3.5 million unique viewers. Um, so somehow, um, somehow there is an, and, and I think I would say new something, Star something Star like that. Yeah. Storm was insane. Somehow yeah. there is a need for what a basic news, yeah. what a basic information. <laughs> yeah. and, stop yeah. and, right. yeah. and stopping that, well, yeah. I don't... And so you appoint for yourself an extra task to do more than that, which yeah. you can't... Yeah, yeah. I don't think that would serve society best. Yeah. There's time for one more question, and there's one comment from uh, Frank. Oh, it's, it's a, actually, actually it's, it's two questions very quick, maybe. One is that I feel that some of the discussion is very reactive. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, you don't seem to tap into the urgency of uh, that this is used, fake news is used deliberately to discredit institutions, including the media. Yeah. Uh, just look, for example, at the BBC that is now, now threatened to get rid of some of its budget by the right-wing well, government that they have, and this is happening also in the Netherlands a little bit, and it might happen more. So is there a pro proactive, a more proactive agenda that we could actually follow to stimulate this idea of open institutions, democracy, uh, trust, and things like that? So yeah. not so reactive. Second is, what should education do to help? Yeah, yeah. Good question. I, I think it's for Craig also, in the sense that you, you can load this question onto the journalist, mm -hmm. saying, can you be more... Uh, proactive in that sense to comment it. You can also broaden it saying, should we expect that of journalists or should other mm -hmm. parties step up for this uh, to stop this undermining? I, I, I think if it's journalists alone, that's where it actually becomes very problematic because then it looks like we're just coming from a position of self-interest. Hmm. Uh, and so thinking about what a whole of society approach is and thinking about how journalism is positioned along with other, you know, core important elements and in institutions in society, because it's not just journalism. We have a, a, tri a trust crisis for a lot of institutions, government and other things. And, uh, and that's a larger problem that we have in Western democracies that, that has yeah. to be engaged with in a big way. There's no, there's no simple answer for that, but I agree with you that there is urgency around it because what does a democracy look like without strong institutions? We don't know. And I don't know that I want to find that out, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. The second part about education. Uh, is so I, I mean I do think for I do think there are some programs that exist um, that have been helping students and training students. Uh, I, I worked with one in Canada called Civics, which has materials online, uh, C I V I X uh, that's there. And so I think the engagement of obviously helping students, but the other part is if you're a research institution, you should be applying your expertise into all of these areas where there's yeah. really interesting work to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a last question from someone who can't sleep tonight if it's not asked. Oh, there are free hands. <laughs> there are still free hands. Yeah, oh, the dead woman, she's almost touching the ceiling with her hands. So maybe. Hi. Um, how do you think that fake news and disinformation, and especially as it's been spreading so much on Facebook, is going to affect future elections? And do you think we'll ever be able to have a fair election again because of these issues? 
Big question, correct? To, uh, to end the note. Uh, so the last one first, yes, absolutely. Like I don't think we're at the point where we've seen results of elections changed as a result of this, and I think it's important to, to keep that in mind. Um, you know, the thing that worries me most in that context is the kind of professionalization of deception and the, the emergence of these professional PR firms, who in most cases, they are being hired by politicians and political parties. So if that becomes a global phenomenon, right now it's very prevalent in the Philippines and some other places, that's to me a very big concern uh, if that market grows. Um, and I think the other thing that we should probably expect is that because Facebook has the fact-checking program, people doing 100% false stuff may actually start to recede because it's not as effective and they'll just simply walk up to the line of not 100% false, not exactly fact-checkable. Mm. And so I think we'll see a real upswing in the amount of sort of like right on the borderline of misleading but not 100% false stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Shannon, is it also a discussion at Nupentanel right now? How can maybe disinformation, misinformation, or fake news affect the elections coming? And what should we do as Nupentanel? Well, we haven't really, like, also because we haven't seen, like, the political disinformation on, well, any skill in the Netherlands. That's not a very prevalent mm -hmm. uh, subject. Uh, of course, we're monitoring, seeing if anything's happening, and I think governments are doing the same. But that's not a very mm. prevalent discussion we're having no. at the moment. Anyways? No, a bit the same. Um, I think we're aware of the mechanisms, um, but, but there are more than, than I thought. <laughs> um, and what we, we will try to do, uh, obviously, is, is cover uh, the, 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 the elections, the United States elections, the elections in, in the yeah. Netherlands next year, um, uh, fairly and objective and from different, different points of view. And I would like to add one, one point to what you're saying about the budget cuts on the, on the BBC. I'm now more than eight year editor in chief of the NOS and we and I have faced budget cuts every year when when we were discussing the budget for the next year. Mm -hmm. Every year that I'm that I'm now uh, editor in chief. So if someone is thinking that the public um, news organization, the public the function of the public news organization is being protected yeah. by yeah. the government, by uh, society, well that's not, that's not completely true. Yeah. That's, that's You're saying that's besides this whole battle uh, or, or this whole discussion, there's a battle to be fought on many levels too. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Craig, maybe to end <laughs> the night, you've been saying that the term fake news uh, cringes you. Uh, what term should you popularize right now <laughs> to maybe uh, for the next years give you some <laughs> breathing room to enjoy your work and also to maybe <laughs> help us understand what's going on? Uh, I will give credit to Claire Wardle and say that I think information disorder is probably a useful one to start using, to think about it in a broader term and to think about, I think one of the themes that has come up tonight is complexity. A yeah. lot of this stuff is very complex and we should not be afraid of complexity in our work and how we engage with the world around us. And information disorder uh, breaks it down in a somewhat complex way. It appreciates different dynamics. So broaden it out, com make it complicated a little bit and don't be afraid of that. Yeah. Well, I would like to thank you all. I think we need to go to the bar because that's one thing maybe we should also do more, just talk more and meet each other live to discuss what we think of it. I would like to thank Bette Dam, Marcel Gelauf and uh, uh, now Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon, so sorry about that. It's been a long night. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. And I would especially like to thank uh, Craig Silverman for coming here and uh, for a fruitful discussion. I hope to see you at the bar. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>